What's up guys? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this Seeding Explained, we'll be looking at Head Count, where a shape-shifting creature terrorizes a group of teens in the desert after one of them reads a mysterious chant from an internet site. Well, there's your first mistake, kid. Don't be reading mysterious chants you find on the internet. It always leads to unleashing evil. When will these teens ever learn? Heads Count basic setup and creature mythology are decent enough, but the execution falls completely flat. This is one of those indie horror movies where not much happens for a lot of the runtime. Literally just kids getting hammered in the desert, all building towards an inevitable big climax. Yet for some reason, the filmmakers actively choose to not show these pivotal scenes on screen, which is just bizarre to me, especially after so much buildup. It makes it honestly feel like it isn't really worth the wait. This is also another one of those that tons of you guys have been asking me to cover, and I do understand why as the entire climax and ending are extremely abrupt, leaving us with many more questions than answers about what the heck just happened. So let's round up your friends for a deadly drunken desert trip in Head Count, where we'll be breaking down the story, digging into the mythology of the hiss G creature and how its ritual works, and explaining the twist ending that sets things up quite nicely for a sequel. We start with the rhyme that informs us of what we'll be dealing with in our story. The hiss G, a vengeful thing, five times its name you never seen, with skin pale white and eyes of green. It's something you've already seen. So it's hard to say what exactly history is at this point, but definitely don't say its name five times. That much is clear. And in our first shot, we cut right to a dude, Evan, with pale skin and green eyes. But I'm sure it's just a coincidence, right? He's dropping off his other pals for some killer boat-based vacation, while he instead is going to visit his weirdo brother who lives in a rundown trailer in the middle of the Joshua Tree Desert. Now that's my kind of vacation. Finding him in deep meditation in the back bedroom area, you'd think he's some kind of drugged out hippie or something, but Peyton actually has an aversion to drugs, preferring to get high on life, if you will. So what do you do in the middle of the desert anyway? Evan is offered the choice of either sound stones, some kind of stones whose reverberations make you feel fucked up afterwards, or hiking. Yeah, I'll go for the hiking, you fruit loop. On the way, the two share some brotherly ribbing, and even more so than usual, as Peyton is also playing both roles of mother and father, broaching subjects like how his grades in school are, or if he's dating anyone. Evan says he's playing the field, but as Peyton says, you gotta actually get some action to count as playing the field. Got him! Peyton proceeds to run off, wanting Evan to chase after him, something they used to do as kids when hiking, apparently. Evan cursing him, saying this happens every time. He squeezes between a small rock space. On the other side, his brother there waiting for him, along with a random group of kids hanging out and getting fucked up. Evan is immediately smitten with one amongst them, Zoe, not Zoe. Zoe, apparently, even though some of the characters call her both for some reason. Pick one! And lucky for Evan, she seems charmed by his pasty prowess, snapping a photo of him. Her friend Camille encourages her to talk to him, but Zoe isn't so sure. She decides to break the ice for her, calling out to the brothers and introducing themselves. And by introducing, asking if they want to smoke some weed. Evan is down, plopping right down next to Zoe, while Peyton keeps his distance from the malevolent marijuana. Zoe and Evan engage in some nice small talk, giving him guff for his goofy race car lighter, but Evan defensively says he's not a redneck, but that it's actually his brother's from years ago. Asking what his deal is, Evan explains that he doesn't like the drugs, which is amusing to Zoe, as he does look like exactly the kind of person you would buy drugs from. True enough, Zoe. Sometime later, it's time for the group of kids to move on from their eventful day of smoking and sitting to head back to where they're staying, and it looks like the burgeoning romance is nipped in the bud before it can blossom. Camille does offer for him to join them, but Evan turns her down saying he has plans with his brother. Peyton tries to win him over by saying he has his own super cool friends that they can meet, his so-called biking buddies, who I'm sure are a fun lot if they're friends with this goofball, and Peyton realizes what his brother actually wants, telling him he has to go back, not allowing him to pass up an opportunity to have some fun. In any way, they still have the whole weekend for some brotherly bonding. What's the harm of one night on his own? Evan catches up to Zoe, who wonders if there's bad blood between him and his brother, as he did choose a group of strangers over him. He admits to some drama, but we don't ever get too much more on the subject beyond that. 
Besides, who has time for getting deep when it's time to get to what the kids are really here for? Heavy amounts of alcohol. So much alcohol! Now this is living. That night the gang gather around a campfire to actually tell ghost stories. And after one of them blows everyone away with his spooky tale, it's Evan's turn at the mic. He's unsure and hesitant, asking if he really has to take a turn. But they suggest to just use the classic website, anonymousnightmares.com, to find a story to read. You can always trust the internet to never steer you astray. Or perhaps not, as however in the world Evan picks a story, he finds one that he reads out called Hisgy, 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 Hisgy. History. Yes, that's five of our demon's name right in the name of the story. And they've already begun the process of summoning him. Way to go! He reads out the weird rhyme from the beginning to everyone's confusion and lack of interest, wondering what the heck kind of scary story that was supposed to be. You know, Evan could have just looked for two seconds himself before reading it out loud, but there's so much social pressure. No time to pick a good one. Just read that one. It's fine. The group finds this story so lame, they declare a story time over. So you know what that means? Back to drinking! As they head inside, a door on a nearby cabin closes on its own. Our first sign that someone or something else is in their midst. It's the history, obviously. Zoe and Evan head to the hot tub. Don't forget the tequila, naturally. He asked about the group's dynamics, and she explains that literally everyone else here is a couple. Going through who is dating who, it doesn't matter, and I don't care, so forget it. And only poor Zoe is the lone single person amongst the entire group, calling herself the ninth wheel. Though she doesn't mind being single, planting a big kiss on a surprised Evan, the two giggling afterwards, but their flirtatious moment is dashed by a sound from out in the desert. Peering into the darkness, there appears to be a man-sized figure with glowing eyes watching them, but they still aren't sure of what they're seeing. A little unnerved, and somehow finding the hot tub too hot, even though hot is right there in the name and everything, it's time to go back inside. Telling the others of what they think they saw, douche extraordinaire Max offers that it might be his loser brother creeping around outside. So it's written off as no big deal, and it's back to the never-ending party. Evan is still concerned, peering out a window, but gets pulled away when Zoe offers him a shot of tequila. Phew, I was starting to wonder what it took to get a drink around here. We learn they definitely aren't just seeing things. A figure obscured in the edge of frame, who then disappears. Hmm, that's certainly odd. What is the deal with this history thing anyway? Zoe and Evan erase their memories with more shots, then luring him back to her room with offerings of better tequila. Great, great news. Evan comes to the next morning, seeing a family photo on the nightstand. Who are these people and how did they get this house anyway? Finding the front door wide open, Evan goes to retrieve his shoes, discovering another set of footprints in the sand, leading back to the derelict cabin. When he gets up, someone with long blonde hair is suddenly standing behind him. He then enters the cabin, finding no signs of anyone, though he does find an odd symbol carved into the wall, a circle with a star inside, what looks like stick figures on each end of the point, and a figure on the top. When putting a finger into the etching, he finds that it's still fresh. The same woman now standing behind him again, but vanishes when Zoe calls out, scaring the crap out of Evan, who doesn't tell her about the symbol or the footsteps, still trying to play it cool in front of his new lady and her super dope friends, who are already all back on the drug train even though it's 9 o'clock in the freaking morning, connoisseur Nico wanting some shrooms for breakfast. Now you're talking. Evan is having such a great time that he decides to stay with the group, who are venturing out in the desert to a lookout point where you can see the whole park. Evan is down, but mentions they are missing someone, the blonde woman he saw at the cabin, but they don't know who he is talking about, blaming it all on the lingering effects of all the sweet, sweet drugs. Hiking to their destination, Zoe and Evan split off on their own, everyone startled by consistent shotgun shots ringing out through the area, most likely courtesy of the drunken bros they saw chilling earlier, leading them to wonder what it is they're actually shooting at. At the lookout spot, Nico goes on about the beauty of doing different psychedelics for each time he visits the desert, and out of nowhere, where Zoe, standing near the edge of a cliff, steps right off the side, injuring her leg in the fall. She appears confused about what happened, and doesn't actually remember stepping over, later recalling that it felt like there was a passenger inside of her own body. Evan is still worried about the person they saw by the hot tub, and an annoyed Max locks the doors to put him at ease, quickly undone when someone knocks aggressively on the door. Turns out it's just a worried Peyton, having not heard from his brother for two days, but Evan 
still decides to stay with his new friends. Max questions him about his whereabouts, accusing him of being outside, but he denies of being here before now. When wondering how he even found the house, Peyton reveals that he has a teen tracking app on his phone to keep tabs on Evan, which everyone finds to be totally lame, laughing at Peyton treating his brother like a little baby boy. But there is a good reason, it turns out, as he tells them he had to act more like a parent to Evan since their parents are both dead totally souring the mood as he leaves dejected. Only one way to perk things up. SHOTS! Oh yeah, baby! Playing a game using a deck of cards, the number five is picked. Our first of the many appearances of the number to come, which when a jack is picked, turns to the always classic Never Have I Ever, with everyone going around and taking a turn, the scene drawn out purposefully to put us at ease. When it's Sam's turn, who we see plainly sitting on the couch, a second Sam pops in from the other room somehow. The lights quickly cut out, everyone baffled, as Sam was sitting right next to her moments ago. How could he be in two places at once? Well, our history is his shapeshifter and was able to blend right in with the kids without them even noticing. He's probably just looking to have a good time. Can you blame him really? These kids know how to party. They search the still dark house, finding no extra people hanging around in the back room, seeing they just missed him, the door closing behind them. They still blame it all on the alcohol and spend the rest of the night in the living room. Evan then comes to the next morning. Seems to be a pattern with these guys. Blackout drunk every night, wake up in a confused state the next morning. Ah, what the hell happened? And and we see another example of five, an arrangement of bottle caps on the ground, seeing even more fives when chatting with Nico in the living room, who divulges that Zoe used to date Max, and she broke up with him, explaining why he's acting like such a jerk to Evan. A stranger coming in and snatching up his girl. Come on, you can't do that even though he's got a new girlfriend, it's fine. They're surrounded by fives, cards around the beer pitcher, all with fives facing up. Five shot glasses, five all over the dang place. Evan is worried about the increasing number coincidences, remembering back to the rhyme. He decides to do some always helpful internet spook research on the history. We see he really should have scrolled down before reading the story, as there are numerous cases listed that appear to be others that have summoned the history prior. And each time, everyone vanished without a trace. A little girl in her blog detailing the same kinds of events the kids have been experiencing, and amongst the photos at the scene include the same symbol Evan found in the cabin, looking like they are doomed to suffer the same fate as the others. After this, Evan wisely decides it's time to get out of here and go spend some time with his brother, encountering Zoe sitting down outside. She says her leg is feeling better and she was able to get out here all on her own. When he tells her he's leaving, she goes for broke to get him to stay, planting a steamy smooch on him. Hmm, wonder why Zoe would want him to stay so much. Maybe because that's not really Zoe. Dun dun dun. The crew is about to head out, and she tells Evan she'll meet him there, riding in the other car. Of course, when he checks the truck, she's not there. Confused, he asks where she is, and Camille explains that her leg isn't any better. In fact, it's bad enough that she couldn't even get out of bed. Uh-oh, not the brightest bulb, are we, Evan? A few others also stayed behind to look after her. And guess how many are there now? Yep, seven. I mean, five. Five, that's the whole thing. Realizing his horrible mistake, and that he was duped by the history. Evan frantically drives back to the house with Camille, which for some impossible reason takes them the entire day to drive back to. I mean, they got to the place in the first place, still daytime, so why does it take 20 times longer to drive back? Who knows? Regardless, by the time they arrive that night, it's too late. They find no one inside the house, but lots of strange evidence left behind. The house now a complete mess, stuff actually attached to the walls, and a display of garbage in a circle, seemingly a recreation of the symbol at the cabin, the points on each end of the star referring to each of the five victims required for the ritual. They then find clues of the fates of their missing friends, a makeshift noose in one room and a toaster in the bathtub, meaning that the five that were left behind were driven to commit suicide due to the history's influence, being able to take advantage of the five of them being there. It appears gotta be five, no more, no less for him to take his victims. Outside, Camille finds the history disguised as Zoe, who tells her that her friends made their own choice choices and we'll live together forever. Oh, that sounds nice actually. Blackout drunk for eternity. Thanks, history. You're not so bad after all. Evan comes in, explaining that's not really Zoe, just as the rest of the group show up. And guess how many are now at the house? Yup, 
five. Here we go again. Zoe begins to count down on her hand from five, seeing a liquid of some kind on the ground. Most likely blood, I would wager. And this must be the circle part of the symbol that surrounds the house in a barrier, indicating the creature's power radius. We quickly see the effects. Once she counts down one finger, one of the group immediately pulls out a pocket knife and slits her own wrist. The histi chooses to reveal what must be its true form, a big-eyed alien-looking guy, but seems like they're going more for a mythological creature rather than it being from space or anything like that. It's definitely weird looking. Fleeing back inside the house, they barricade the door, and the histi tries to trick them again, Haley appearing and banging on the door. Her boyfriend really wants to help, but they know it's not her. It then leaps onto the roof, mimicking Zoe's voice, then the others, them wondering what it wants. Clearly it wants you, you fool. The light bulbs pop, and seeing the histi quickly flipping through each of the kids' visages, holding up four fingers still. Then he goes down to one. Immediately in the house, the guys all follow Vanessa in a trance. Nico goes for a nice drink of bleach, Camille grabbing a knife, making it pretty clear what's about to go down. Yet rather than show us the gruesome suicides, we pull outside, hearing only blood-curdling screams from inside. Things suddenly going quiet for a moment until Evan runs out, blood splatter all over his shirt. He doesn't get too far when reaching the barrier, sees a mirror image of the house on the other side, meaning there's no way he's gonna be getting out of here. He attempts to call his brother, getting his voicemail as usual, pleading with him to come back to the house and seemingly knowing his chances of survival tells him he loves him and gives a wistful goodbye. Rattling and electricity hissing all around him, the lights cut out, and Zoe returns, comfortingly telling him they'll all be together now. Reaching out her hand, holding Peyton's race car lighter, Evan takes it and clicks it on, again cutting away before seeing this pivotal moment. We jump to the next day, Peyton on his way to the house, having not heard from his brother in several days at this point. When he arrives, we only see the aftermath of Evan's moment, the burnt remnants of the cabin seen in the corner meaning that just as with the others, he was coerced into taking his own life by the Hischi, burning the cabin down with him inside. The house, on the other hand, is back to normal and appears completely unchanged, with no sign of the tin killed whatsoever. Man, the Hischi is sure good at cleanup, and from what we can tell, has a kind of control over reality as well, at least within its little barrier thing. Peyton finds his lighter in a bowl, the bottom singed black, but still functioning. Lucky, and only now does he get a chime on his cell phone, alerting him to his brother's friend frantic final calls. Just as he's about to listen, his brother enters, saying everybody left and he's ready to get out of here. Evan then apologizes for being an asshole to his brother, going in for a bro hug, the two warmly leaving together. There's still one more day until Evan heads back to school. So Peyton suggests introducing him to some of his friends, boasting they are chill peeps. Sounds perfect, Evan smirks, because of course it isn't actually Evan, but the Hischi assuming his form, as every one of the kids was killed or really killed themselves. And of course, the sound of meeting some new friends sounds appealing because it wants more victims. Just hope they're in multiples of five, or otherwise he's gonna run into some trouble. With that, we have reached a conclusion of this ending explained for Headcount. While not that great overall, and it definitely felt like a lower quality version of It Follows, it was still well produced and has a fairly compelling new villain in the shape-shifting history, and perhaps a sequel could continue the story and take it into a new direction that focuses more on the creature and less on the dumb dumb teenagers. Might have something on their hands there in that case. What did you guys think of Headcount and its ending? Would you like to see the Hischi return in a sequel? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.